So we have a new experimental flask containing two competing strains, modern and living fossil, and we want to know which of the two strains will outpopulate the other. But they're all mixed up, so how do you tell? How do you distinguish the two strains when they are mixed together in the competition flask? I told you it was ingenious. You remember the colour coding with the reds, ara minus, and the whites, ara plus? Now, if you wanted to compare the fitness of, say, tribe five with the ancestral population, what would you do? Let's suppose that tribe five was ara plus. Well then, you'd make sure that the ancestral fossils to which you now compare tribe five were ara minus, and if tribe six happens to be ara minus, the fossils that you choose to unfreeze and mix them with would all be ara plus. The ara plus and ara minus genes themselves, as the Lenski team already knew from previous work, have no effect on fitness. So they could use the colour markers to assay the competitive abilities of each of the evolving tribes using fossilised ancestors as the competitive standard in every case. All they had to do was simply plate out samples from the mixed flasks and see how many of the bacteria growing on the agar were white and how many red. As I say, in all twelve tribes, the average fitness increased as the thousands of generations went by. All twelve lines got better at surviving in these glucose-limited conditions. The fitness increase could be attributed to several changes. Populations grew faster in successive flasks, and the average body size of the bacteria grew in all twelve lines. Fourteen. The single line graph plots the average bacterial body size for one of the tribes, which was typical. The blobs represent real data points. The curve drawn is a mathematical approximation. It gives the best fit to the observed data for this particular kind of curve, which is called a hyperbola. It is always possible that a more complicated mathematical function than a hyperbola would give an even closer fit to the data, but this hyperbola is pretty good, so it seems hardly worth bothering to try. Biologists often fit mathematical curves to observed data, but unlike physicists, biologists are not accustomed to seeing such a close fit. Usually, our data are too messy. In biology, as opposed to physical sciences, we only expect to get smooth curves when we have a very large quantity of data. Gathered under scrupulously controlled conditions, Lenski's research is a class act. You can see that most of the increase in body size occurred in the first two thousand or so generations. The next interesting question is this: Given that all twelve tribes increased in body size over evolutionary time, did they all increase in the same way by the same genetic route? No, they didn't, and that's the second interesting result. As we've said, the single line graph is for one of the twelve tribes. Now look at the equivalent hyperbolic best fits for all twelve, the multiple line graph. Look how spread out they are. They all seem to be approaching a plateau, but the highest of the twelve plateaus is almost twice as high as the lowest, and the curves have different shapes. The curve that reaches the highest value at generation ten thousand starts by growing more slowly than some of the others, and then overtakes them before generation seven thousand. Don't confuse these plateaus, by the way, with the daily plateaus of population size within each flask. We are now looking at curves in evolutionary time measured in flask generations, not individual bacterial time measured in hours within one flask. What this evolutionary change suggests is that becoming larger is, for some reason, a good idea when you are struggling to survive in this alternating glucose-rich, glucose-poor environment. I won't speculate on why increasing body size might be an advantage. There are many possibilities, but it looks as though it must have been so because all twelve tribes did it. But there are lots of different ways to become larger, different sets of mutations. And it looks as though different ways have been discovered by different evolutionary lineages in this experiment. That's pretty interesting, but perhaps even more interesting is that sometimes a pair of tribes seem to have independently discovered the same way of getting bigger.
Lenski and a different set of colleagues investigated this phenomenon by taking two of the tribes, called Ara plus one and Ara minus one, which seemed, over 20,000 generations, to have followed the same evolutionary trajectory, and looking at their DNA. The astonishing result they found was that 59 genes had changed their level of expression in both tribes, and all 59 had changed in the same direction. Were it not for natural selection, such independent parallelism in 59 genes independently would completely beggar belief. The odds against its happening by chance are stupefyingly large. This is exactly the kind of thing creationists say cannot happen, because they think it is too improbable to have happened by chance. Yet it actually happened, and the explanation, of course, is that it didn't happen by chance, but because gradual, step by step, Cumulative natural selection favoured the same, literally the same, beneficial changes in both lines independently. The smooth curve in the graph of increasing cell size as the generations go by gives support to the idea that the improvement is gradual. But perhaps it is too gradual. Wouldn't you expect to see actual steps as the population waits for the next improving mutation to turn up? Not necessarily. It depends on factors such as the number of mutations involved, the magnitude of each mutation's effect, and the variation in cell size that is caused by influences other than genes, and how often the bacteria were sampled. And interestingly, if we look at the graph of the increase in fitness as opposed to cell size, we do see what could at least be interpreted as a more overtly stepped picture. 15. You remember... When I introduced the hyperbola, I said it might be possible to find a more complicated mathematical function that would fit the data better. Mathematicians call it a model. You could fit a hyperbolic model to these points, as in the previous graph, but you get an even better fit with a step model. It's not such a close fit as the cell size graphs fit to a hyperbola. In neither case can it be proved that the data exactly fit the model, nor can that ever be done but the data are at least compatible with the idea that the evolutionary change that we observe represents the stepwise accumulation of mutations. We have so far seen a beautiful demonstration of evolution in action, evolution before our very eyes, documented by comparing 12 independent lines and also by comparing each line with living fossils, which literally, instead of only metaphorically, come from the past. Now we're ready to move on to an even more interesting result. So far, I've implied that all twelve tribes evolved their improved fitness in the same general kind of way, differing only in detail, some being a bit faster, some a bit slower than others. However, the long-term experiment threw up one dramatic exception. Shortly after Generation 33,000, something utterly remarkable happened. One out of the twelve lineages called Ara minus three, suddenly went berserk. 16. OD, which stands for optical density or cloudiness, is a measure of population size in the flask. The liquid becomes cloudy because of the sheer numbers of bacteria. The thickness of the cloud can be measured as a number, and that number is our index of population density. Up to about generation 33,000, the average population density of tribe Ara-3 was coasting along at an OD of about 0.04, which was not very different from all the other tribes. Then, just after generation 33,100, the OD score of tribe Ara-3 and of that tribe alone among the 12 went into vertical takeoff. It shot up sixfold to an OD value of about 0.25. The populations of successive flasks of this tribe soared. After only a few days, the typical plateau at which flasks of this tribe stabilized had an OD number about six times greater than it had been and than the other tribes were still showing. This higher plateau was then reached in all subsequent generations in this tribe but no other. It was as though a large dose of extra glucose had been injected into every flask of tribe Ara-3, but given to no other tribe. But that didn't happen. 
the same glucose ration was scrupulously administered to all the flasks equally. What was going on? What was it that suddenly happened to Tribe Ara-3? Lenski and two colleagues investigated further and worked it out. It's a fascinating story. You remember I said that glucose was the limiting resource, and any mutant that discovered how to deal more efficiently with glucose would have an advantage. That, indeed, is what happened in the evolution of all twelve tribes. But I also told you that glucose was not the only nutrient in the broth. Another one was citrate, related to the substance that makes lemon sour. The broth contained plenty of citrate, but E. coli normally can't use it, at least not where there is oxygen in the water, as there was in Lenski's flasks. But if only a mutant could discover how to deal with citrate, a bonanza would open up for it. This is exactly what happened with Ara-3. This tribe, and this tribe alone, suddenly acquired the ability to eat citrate as well as glucose, rather than only glucose. The amount of available food in each successive flask in the lineage therefore shot up, and so did the plateau at which the population in each successive flask daily stabilised. Having discovered what was special about the Ara-3 tribe, Lenski and his colleagues went on to ask an even more interesting question. Was this sudden improvement in ability to draw nourishment all due to a single dramatic mutation, one so rare that only one of the twelve lineages was fortunate enough to undergo it? Was it, in other words, just another run-of-the-mill mutational step, like those in all the tribes? This seemed to Lenski unlikely, for an interesting reason. Knowing the average mutation rate of each gene in the genome of these bacteria, he calculated that 30,000 generations was long enough for every gene to have mutated at least once in each of the 12 lines. So it seemed unlikely that it was the rarity of the mutation that singled Ara-3 out. It should have been discovered by several other tribes. There was another theoretical possibility, and an extremely tantalising one. 